liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis. Uh, we've got Josh Bernstein on the line. Hopefully, Josh, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. See, now that's a backdrop. Just <laughs> yes. honestly, you know, it's a good back. Yeah. What have we got? Space helmet. We've got sort of Indiana Jones helmet. We're a little jealous. What well, have we got? We've, we've got, got a space. Well, Russian space stuff is pretty cool too. I have to say. You've got the perfect sort of Nat Geo backdrop, microscope, <laughs> space stuff. It's mm -hmm, all there. Mm -hmm. Big knife hanging from things. <laughs> hey, listen, we just had Jim Christensen from NASA talking a little, teeing you up usually talking about Project uh, Janos. I heard. And the sort of values behind that and the philosophy behind that. But tell us more. We want to know more, a little bit about your extraordinary adventures um, and a little bit more about Janos. Sure, happy to. And, and is Jonathan, I think Jonathan's on with me as well, correct? Oh, hi, yeah. Jonathan. Sorry, I, 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 we're going to judge you by your backdrop. <laughs> I've got an interesting poster back there. But yeah. Not uh, as cool as Josh's. That's right. So, yes, yeah, so Dallas, what I, what I thought I'd do, if it's okay, I have a presentation. Can I hit play? And then, and then okay. And this will help because, you know, so much of what I do is visual. Yeah, we'll yes. ourselves and let you. All right, cool. So here we go. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Hopefully this will work. Uh, you'll tell me if this, if you can't see this, but I'm hoping that you'll see. Uh, this is a, this is a video that I'm gonna get to in a minute. But as you said, Dallas, there is a bit of a backstory. Jim did set me up nicely, uh, but I wanna, I wanna get to how we are, how we are working for NASA with Project Janos and my talk, which I'll be splitting with Jonathan. I'm gonna handle part one, which is Project Janos, the origin story. Uh, I'll deepen what Jim just said. Part two, I'll get into the videos. This will take about 30 minutes for these first two parts, and I'll turn it over to Jonathan for the curriculum and how we marry the videos to what happens in the classroom. And then at the end, I'll come back, hopefully, to have a talk with you and Susie Dallas so we can, like, you know, answer any questions. Is that good? Okay, cool. Great. So, so okay, the origin story, like I said, I, I, I'm uh, any presenter, Dallas, you'll appreciate it. any presenter who's worked at the BBC or Discovery or History Channel, in my case, you get the privilege of traveling the world on someone else's dime. My forte, having a degree in anthropology, is uh, I was an archaeology host. I was a host of a show called Digging for the Truth, which was very much in the genre of Indiana Jones, as you can tell from the marketing here. And so for three years, I traveled the planet exploring the biggest mysteries of temples and tombs and going into dark places, really from the Amazon to the Arctic to the Alps to bring those mysteries to light. And then after my contract with History ended, I moved over to Discovery Channel for two years, working on another series called Into the Unknown with me. And, uh, and so that gave me, just visually, I'll walk you through some of it because this does play into the backstory of, of how I ended up working with NASA. Here I am exploring the pyramids of Egypt, obviously. Uh, every episode was an hour and we tried to bring that story to audiences around the world in grand fashion. Closer to home for you folks, I'm in England exploring the mysteries of Stonehenge and what, what went into the construction, the placement, and how these giant sarsens were, were moved. Did another story in Greenland on the trail of the Vikings. The mystery here is, did the Vikings get to America before Columbus, which you know, here in the US, we've been talking about Columbus for more years than perhaps we should have when the Vikings were here long before, long before Columbus. Uh, I'm standing on an iceberg here, not for any reason other than curiosity. I was just wondering, you know, What's it like? And it's not something that's recommended. It's highly dangerous, but thrilling at the same time. So I, I decided to stand on one. Here I am in Yemen, exploring uh, in the back country in the wild west of Yemen, in a sense, with the sheikhs, looking at the Queen of Sheba and the Sabaean Kingdom. I'm so, and so sorry, but we can't see your slides. Really? Oh, my. Uh, after all that. Okay, hold on. Let me. Can yeah. you try sharing screen again? Yeah. Let me, uh, let me try again. Here we go. Thank you for how about, now we see them. Great. Perfect. All right. So then that uh, thank you for popping in there. So now can you see the slides? Yes, yep, we, can. we can. Perfect. All right. Well, gee, well, I hear it's a visual medium. Thank you for, for thank you, Susie. So um, okay, so here's my show. <laughs> you'll you'll know the old radio version. Here's the video version. And now I can see it. So that's me hosting the History Channel show. I'll go quicker to catch up for lost time. That's my discovery series. And again, both of these were uh, me, there, this makes more sense now, me in grand fashion, exploring the greatest mysteries on the planet. So here I am at the, obviously it's Giza Plateau, exploring the pyramids. Uh, now I'm in England, as I said, I talked about the uh, Greenland and 
and exploring the Viking Trail, standing on an iceberg, which is not something I would ever recommend, but it is kind of thrilling if you have the chance. And here was where I left off in Yemen, exploring the Sabayan Kingdom uh, and Queen of Sheba. Uh, each of these episodes was an opportunity for me to not just go into some remote location and explore a mystery, but to bring that to a global audience. And so uh, here I am with Chief Afukaka in the Amazon, looking at the, the disappearance of Colonel Percy Fawcett. Uh, and then here I am in the Arctic, uh, looking at the disappearance of summer ice in the Arctic and what that means for polar bears. In any case, all of these adventures and mysteries are backdrop for a, a platform where I established myself as someone who goes to the ends of the earth to bring mysteries to the world. And that gave birth to a program called Explorer at Large. That's my company now. And Explorer at Large has two tag words. You can see virtus et curiositas. That means courage and curiosity in, uh, in Latin. And we say you have to be curious to ask questions and courageous enough to find answers, right? to seek those answers. And so we've been working now with the Smithsonian uh, for first and now with NASA to create a, an ecosystem of learning that encompasses four parts, which transition into what we're going to discuss with NASA. So the videos that I host, the activities that the education team creates for teachers to implement in classrooms, the field trips that take you out of the classroom into the community, and then these what we call family moments where you bring it all home to, to influence your community and your family unit in a way that elevates and shares what you've learned as an explorer. And so in my, in my similar work for history and discovery now with Smithsonian, I have been going into the field with, say, a conservation biologist like Rob Aguilar on the Chesapeake Bay to look at the ways that scientists uh, study fish populations. You'll notice these two, these two electrodes hanging off the front of this boat send a current into the water. It's called electrofishing. And then I scoop them up with a net. The fish are stunned for a moment. They're not killed. They're stunned. And then you can gather them and put them. And it was a fascinating story. Like Science is truly fascinating. I think where we've lost some of the some of the appeal is in the storytelling around it. So my job in this case is to go into Smithsonian's assets. Here I am at the Smithsonian's National Zoo in Washington, talking to Marty Deary about giant pandas. And you'd be surprised to know that giant pandas eat bamboo all day long. And as a result, they poop a lot. And what the scientists do is they gather that poop and tell they can determine how healthy the panda is from the shape, the texture, the water, like how much water or moisture is or is not. So they do the same thing at the National Zoo with the lions. Here I am with Craig Sappho exploring the great cat. He's the curator of great cats. And I'm learning, here is Luke. Luke is one of the lions in the pride at, uh, at the National Zoo. And we're learning like, how do they track the health of the pride? So that's just a, a sense of what Explorer at Large does. These videos, these activities, the activities themselves are implemented in classrooms from kindergarten through 12th grade. We, we do, uh, lessons that are STEM or um, let's say curriculum driven in the classrooms. And then we take that and we extrapolate into the community. So if you're studying orchids in a video, you then go to let's say a conservatory to, to study plants and learn about plants from experts there. So that's, that is the ecosystem of Explorer at large. And the way that this translates into NASA, as Jim said, and as actually Andy said on, our, on your earlier talk with Andy Aldrin, who's an old friend, Andy and I have been, he mentioned he loves to dive. Andy and I have been dive buddies for almost 10 years. Uh, we, we share a lot of pa similar passions when it comes to education. And Andy called me and said, this was about a year, maybe 14 months ago. He said, there's a NASA opportunity to create STEM education content specifically for middle school students, right? So people who we hear would say from fifth to eighth grade, uh, are you interested? And I said, of course I'm interested. How can I, you know, how, how can I, of course I'm interested. So we put together a team under Andy's, uh, the Aldrin Family Foundation's leadership, where in, or the Aldrin Family Foundation, where Andy and Jim, Club for the Future, which is Blue Origin, Explorer at Large, uh, Public Consulting Group and University of Kansas, come together to create Project Janos. And we each have our roles. Uh, AFF, Aldrin Family Foundation, is the, um, the lead, right? They're the contractor with NASA. Andy is the principal investigator. Club for the Future is our partner for getting postcards into space, which is a fantastic opportunity for people participating in Project Janos. You can, you can mail them a postcard and it will actually be flown on a Blue Origin New Shepard rocket as payload. It'll go up to space and come back and get stamped and then send back to you. And we've incorporated that into our lessons. My part is the pedagogy as the explorer and producer of content for Explorer at Large. Public Consulting Group in Boston 
is the, uh, the pipeline into classrooms. PCG has the Pepper platform, which is an edX uh, developed by MIT and Harvard. They, they are putting us into, I believe, 70,000 classrooms in the United States, and then eventually will be global. And then finally, University of Kansas does the IRB, the oversight, research, and evaluation. So it's a fairly robust ecosystem of, of partners. And all of that went into, as Jim said, Project Janos. And the name, yes, is uh, referenced. We love our, we love our Greco-Roman nomenclature with the, like uh, NASA loves Apollo and Artemis and all the different constellations come from usually Greco-Roman references. We picked Janos or Janus, the Roman god of time, portals, space, uh, doorways, we did this because as Jim did say, and I'll, re I'll restate, we have two faces of Janos, the Greek version of the Roman God's name. The, the old man looks to the past with wisdom, in this case, to the moon and the Apollo missions. And the young face looks to the future with promise, in this case, Mars. It works well for our purposes, which was to tell the story of the past, present, and future of human spaceflight. And in the middle, you can see is a rocket taking off from Cape Canaveral, in this case, a Saturn V, another homage to the Apollo missions. So, so that's, that's the origin of how Project Janos came to be. Uh, we are about to, honestly, you're, the timing is interesting that given this is Space Week, we are launching today. Like as of, like I was up till midnight last night planning because our website just went live last night. The content for teachers went live last night. And so maybe I'll use that as an opportunity to share a little bit more about the videos you'll see. This is a two minute, three minute video, which for those who are visually uh, inspired the way I am here. I'll, I'll just be quiet for a minute. You can see Andy and me talking about the concept and how, how it plays out. So here, here's a video. A new NASA funded education initiative launches in summer 2021. It's called Project Janos. Kids love two things. They love space and they love dinosaurs. And they get over dinosaurs before too long. They never get over space. In 1969, Apollo program astronauts Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong took their first steps on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The day NASA's Artemis program is preparing to land the first woman and the next man on the surface of the moon. NASA wants to communicate their story and they want to get kids excited about space exploration. Kids in school today are going to be applying for jobs on the moon. It's not just for astronauts. To get kids excited, experts in human spaceflight, curriculum design, video production, and online teacher training courses have formed Project Janos. Their mission, to engage and educate students with the wonders of space and to inspire them to become explorers of it. It all begins with compelling stories. When I started thinking about compelling stories, I started thinking about compelling storytellers, and the best storyteller I know is Josh Bernstein. As a host for series on National Geographic, History, and Discovery Channels, I know the value of good storytelling. For Project Janos, because our content is for students, it's additionally important that the videos be engaging and educational. This is done in a three-step process. First, videos hosted by Josh engage students by introducing them to real-life experts in human spaceflight. As the host, I select actual questions submitted by students and seek answers with experts from NASA and space companies like Blue Origin, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, and ILC Dover. In the process, we expose students to potential passions and career path opportunities in human space. In the second step, the education team creates expeditions and missions that connect the videos to standards aligned activities. James and I are very excited to be partnering with Project Janos to develop curriculum for students in the classroom. We are teachers making lessons for teachers. We know what will keep the students engaged. The third step, distribution. The Pepper online learning platform managed by the public consulting group places Project Janos content into 75,000 U.S. schools, reaching over 3.8 million middle school students, including those from underserved communities. The PCG platform is an excellent platform for teachers to access Project Jonas. The end result, an education experience that helps students appreciate the past, present, and future challenges and triumphs of human spaceflight. Hopefully that played. Maybe you guys can tell me if that, uh, at this point I'm nervous that maybe my, my screen isn't connecting, but let's see. 
Can you guys still hear me? Just checking. Cool. Uh, so uh, I think the, the so as I said, the, the videos, they they went up uh, and they, they are now active. You can go to projectyanos.org and you can go and look at all the videos on our on our YouTube platform. Uh, we put them up a month ago for some internal prep, but as of last night, you should be able to access them. And, and you can see we've done 12 videos for our pilot, our initial launch. There's, um, there's a mixture of episodic videos where I go on these quests, launched from questions from students. Right? So we, we started this process with 1,500 questions submitted by middle school students. And then that gave birth to these various adventures. And then there's profiles. So the profiles give you spotlight into the world of these subject matter experts. Uh, and, and the episodes are, are tied to the sort of the ecosystem of learning that I spoke about. So a good example, as I, we talk about this a little bit in the, in the video you just saw, but, but here I am looking at the uh, ISS mock-up at Space Center Houston with Jennifer Hammond. Jennifer works for Boeing. She is the head of uh, ISS Mission Evaluations Room Manager. And so she's showing me the number one question from all the students that we got was, as you can imagine, how do you poop in space, right? So here I am sitting on a space toilet. It's comical, but it's also informative because there is differences when you don't have gravity or if you're in microgravity. So Jennifer is showing me the practical nature of what it takes to poop in space. Similarly, uh, I then actually went from Jennifer to meet Dr. Scott Parazinski, an astronaut who's been on five shuttle missions and seven spacewalks, and he's an MD. So Scott was the perfect person for me to talk to about what's it like to actually live in space and yes, poop in space. So that helps inform our students with the, like, the reality of not just the conceptual, but the actual practical aspect of what it's like to go to the bathroom or to sleep in space or to eat in space or any other number of questions that came to us from the students in the initial group. The, um, the, the Another episode here on rockets specifically standing under literally the five F1s of the Saturn V with, with the Quintero. Natalie works for the Space Launch System, another Boeing uh, project as a systems engineer. And so we're talking about how SLS is put together and how the RS-25 engines compare to the F1s. And then, and then, and then that same episode, I met with, uh, with Eduardo uh, Lopez to look at, he's a rocket scientist and Eddie is talking to me about the RS-25, in this case at Space Center Houston. Uh, and what it takes, like what is the, how much thrust is generated? What are the mechanics? How do a rocket scientists decide what types of propellants are used? Which is important, right? For a number of considerations. Is the ability to use water ice on the moon uh, practical when it comes to needing the, the ability to produce it, the kind of thrust it generates, et cetera. So another conversation with, uh, hold on, here we go, with, with LaShawn Bulware, she works for Lockheed Martin on the Orion capsule and works, well, she's a human factors design engineer. And again, like the, the, the opportunities of Project Janos are to, to introduce you to experts in the field, bring those experts and their knowledge and their passion into the classroom and give you a launching point into this wonderful world of spaceflight. So with that said, as a, as a prelude, let me show you, this is one of the eight episodes that we created in the past year. We filmed during COVID, so you'll notice that we're standing a bit farther apart than we normally would. But hopefully, this will give you a feeling. This is a this is the first time we're showing this. This is a bit of a premiere. Uh, this is the first time we're going to show you any one of our episodes. This one runs about five minutes, and the question, as you'll see, the student asking it on camera: How do you exercise in space? Here we go. In this episode, we explore what it's like for astronauts to exercise and stay healthy in space. So now I got to go through it again. Project Yanos, you are go for launch. Hey, Josh Bernstein here. Ever wondered what it's like to exercise in space? Sixth grader Christian has. What is it like to exercise with no gravity? Excellent question, Christian. And I've got a few more. What's it like to lift weights in space when everything's weightless? How does NASA measure the effect of living in zero gravity? What effect does zero G have on muscles and bones? Those are just some of my questions. Let's search for answers together.
to learn about living in space, I'm visiting Space Center Houston in Texas to meet Jennifer Hammond, a Boeing engineer who leads mission evaluations of the International Space Station. So this is a typical cardio machine that astronauts would use. It's just a way to get your muscles going. Astronauts do cardio. Yeah. They lift weights. But weights, I imagine, are different because a 50-pound dumbbell wouldn't weigh anything in space. Correct. They need to use a resistance system. Cables, rather than weights, provide the resistance needed in space to challenge muscles, helping astronauts maintain their muscle mass. How much time in an astronaut's day is allocated for working out? Anywhere from one to two hours. They have different plans and regimens. Um, they'll do cardio some days. They'll do strength training other days, much like we would here on Earth. But unlike here on Earth, where it might be elective, it's actually mandatory in space, isn't it? it absolutely is mandatory, yes. You have to make sure that you're maintaining your muscle mass and your bone density because you're not using your muscles in the same way when you're in space. They're not working against gravity. Mm -hmm. So they have to maintain that even more in space. We've seen images of astronauts being helped or even carried after they get back to Earth and have to deal with gravity again. To better understand this, I'm meeting Phyllis Friello, an education specialist and biologist. So Josh, what we're doing this morning is we're taking a look at the functional task test. Now this is part of a test that's conducted with astronauts pre and post flight to try and find out how their body responds to being in conditions of weightlessness or microgravity. This functional task test is one of many that NASA puts astronauts through before and after spaceflight. NASA does this test. This is legit. Yes, this is done just right across the street at Johnson Space Center. All right, let's do it. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. Go. And around as fast as you can without touching. You keep going. You keep going. And end. What again? 9.78. Okay. With a baseline time established, we now want to see how I might perform the same exact test after spending six months in space. So you've probably seen pictures of when the astronauts come back from space, their balance is a little bit off. That is because they've been working and living in a weightless environment. We can't send you to space, but we do have something that will challenge your balance or your vestibular system. These are prison glasses and they just change the orientation of your sight. So in lieu of going to space, put these on. Put those on. Okay. Yeah, that's wild. This is not what the astronauts experience. Whoa. Their challenge is a little bit different, but this is the best we can do in one G. Okay, so now I gotta go through it again? You're going to do the course just like you did before, <laughs> but challenged. Oh, yeah. Remember, try and go as quickly as you can, but without touching any of the poles. Okay. Ready, yep. go. Whoa. Step over and under, <laughs> and then over and around. Oh, I just hit that. Your first pole. Hang on, I hit that. The second. Oh, hang on, I hit that. <laughs> towards the green this is trippy this way around the blue okay oh and then straight towards me okay. and stop. stop excellent job what did i get 20 seconds 20 so twice as long twice as long and is that normal that's pretty normal for this like yeah. with the astronauts it is more of a physiological challenge because they've been maybe up to six months in space mm -hmm. So the muscles are different. The bone density is different. There's no weight loading on their bones. And the loading on our bones keeps our bones healthy. Unlike a three-day trip to the moon, getting to Mars will take seven months. NASA wants to be sure that humans can arrive there physically strong enough to explore the environment. Just by changing orientation, I completely shift my perspective, literally. And then the insights I get about what astronauts will be facing on the moon or Mars. Yes. Sweet. That's cool. As more humans go into space, we will learn more and more about human physiology and what it takes to keep our bones and muscles strong in space, on the moon, and beyond. Okay. Thanks for uh, watching that. That's like I said, you guys are the first to see that video presented anywhere because we're just launching uh, last, like today. Today is the big launch for Project Janos. Uh, I want to introduce Jonathan officially, formally. Uh, also, I want to introduce two of his colleagues who I'm not sure they'll be joining Jonathan uh, on the on the Zoom. They can't because they're on the West Coast. But that Jonathan Jonathan is the head of our team at PCG, uh, the public consulting group that is putting the pipeline into classrooms. And two of his colleagues that we've been enjoying working with over the past year, James whoop, James Burke. And how do I get back to that one? James Burke and um, and Jason Ewart. And th this is part of the J team. 
the J team as we got and also with Josh. So we fit into the J team as needed. But uh, they, they've been responsible for taking these videos and marrying them, as I said, to the curriculum and the needs of teachers. James and Jason are both uh, employed currently in middle school. They're fantastic teachers. They, they're veterans of knowing what works in the classroom. Jonathan wrote the book on what works in the classroom. So I think that um, I'll turn it over to you, Jonathan. And, and as I said, folks, afterwards, if you're interested, go to projectyanos.org and I'll turn off my, my microphone and, and now watch. Thank you so much. Uh, I, need to, I forgot to pick it up to the stop share button. There we go, thank you. Thanks, Josh. Um, can everybody hear me first of all? Yes. Okay, uh, great, well, that's uh, always a tough act to follow, but um, the, yeah, I wanted kind of to share with you what happens after students watch the videos that uh, Josh has, uh, Josh has showed you one. Um, in fact, there are several videos integrated throughout the program, which I'll show you. But um, the thing I want to sort of key into is, you know, there are several things unique about Project Yanos. First and foremost is the storytelling, right? You've just seen one of uh, Josh's Explore at Large videos. He's talking about exercise in space, but there's other videos about building rockets, as he mentioned, uh, designing spacesuits, uh, uh, recycling wastewater as part of a sort of peeing and pooping in space, which is, is always of interest to kids. Um, and that storyline continues, the storytelling continues within the curriculum uh, when I'll, I'll show you the curriculum on the platform. And the curriculum is designed around um, not units and lessons, but expeditions and missions in which students perform tasks. And that vocabulary was deliberately taken from NASA uh, because that's what astronauts and engineers and explorers and scientists do. They engage in expeditions where they're not just learning, but discovering. So that's woven throughout even the language of Project Janos. Project Janos also itself is built around a scenario, a storyline, uh, uh, Josh mentioned that that Project Janos is looking both sort of back and forth. The, the videos Josh is showing you is uh, the current state of affairs of space, also harkening back to the past, whereas Janos is uh, the curriculum looks towards the future, where the students are participating in an overall large project, one in which NASA has designed des decided to build an ice mining facility on the moon. And all the activities they're doing is in contribution to that goal. They have to uh, make a design decision about a rocket. Well, that gets you into space. They've got to make decisions in terms of a process, test a process for recycling wastewater. Well, that's the thing you need to do while you're on your way to the moon and, and, and on the moon to uh, recycle wastewater so you don't have to bring it all with you from the earth. Um, when you're working on the moon, you're in space suits. There's a video on spacesuit design, but in the curriculum, they're actually uh, testing a system for repairing a spacesuit component, a glove, in which they're learning stitching. Okay, so not necessarily something one does every day in science class, but in this, they're learning and testing a set of techniques for sealing a repair in a spacesuit glove that includes stitching. And those of you know the story of the seamstresses who worked on the original space uh, Apollo spacesuits, that this is an important way to connect them to craft the craftsmanship that's involved with science and engineering. And, you know, I'll, I'll show you the, in detail, the uh, activity associated with exercising in space that goes with the video Josh just showed you. But in that case, they're actually building a piece of exercise equipment and testing it with themselves as the subject. So, so that's a place where the sort of storyline meets this idea of, of a project-based curriculum. If you were here when Jim was talking about uh, some of the work uh, the Aldrin Foundation does, a lot of that is project-based where you're not just following sort of cookbook recipe for an experiment, you're actually doing things, okay? And that the activities you're doing, you are in the roles of a data scientist, of a testing engineer, uh, where you're, uh, for example, um, running through a uh, set of data analysis to determine how heavy are objects when they come to the moon. Uh, what is the what are the ratios that are of oxida oxidizer to fuel that you need in a rocket engine? And you're using that to make design decisions. And, and this is where you know those those two 
kind of, of folks you saw on the previous slide, uh, James and Jason, you know, th these folks are not just um, highly skilled curriculum developers, you know, but they've been teachers, they've been teaching science class for decades, right? So when they created these activities, they did so with kind of engagement in mind, trying to get students to do things they may have never done in a science class before. Okay. And um, the, the final piece of kind of pillar to, to Janos is kind of ease of implementation that there's a lot of sophisticated curriculum out there from academic publishers, from organizations like Open OpenSciEd. Um, it's fabulous stuff. And, and I'm guessing many of the teachers in this audience are familiar with it, but often a lot of it is kind of very hard to implement in the classroom, right? You, you may be dumped with a, a giant PDF and then you have to sort of figure out all the pieces you need to implement the classroom. A lot of this material was created before we all went online and obviously we're back in classrooms now, but there's still sort of distance components that um, may not have been worked into curriculum that was developed specifically for the classroom. With Janos, we, at every stage, we're thinking about, well, for your teachers out you, we're thinking about you. Right, you know, might you be delivering this class, in this uh, these expeditions and missions in a classroom remotely or in a blended environment? We thought through the design of the activities with that in mind, um, but also, you know, what are the materials you need? How much might they, you know, do they cost? Uh, how how can you imp how can you implement the this in your classroom as simply as possible? Um, so that, you know, basically we're, we're trying to figure, make sure that the curriculum does not, that, that, that the, the practical aspects do not get in the way of implementing the curriculum anywhere. Okay, so let me share screen and I'll show you what this looks like to, for a teacher. Okay, so um, this is the Pepper platform. Hey, this is, as Josh mentioned, it's based on edX, which is a platform developed by Harvard and MIT, but used by dozens of universities around the world to deliver massive open online courses, uh, but also used by a number of organizations, um, commercial organizations, nonprofit, to deliver all kinds of training. The Pepper plat this Pepper platform uses edX to deliver professional development training to educators, to teachers. And as uh, Josh mentioned, it's used in thousands of schools by thousands of educators. Um, th this course is like other Pepper courses, it's, it's designed for teachers. Okay, this has been put together so that teachers can implement Project Janos without necessarily having to uh, go through extensive professional development. You know, everything you need to understand and implement the curriculum is available in this course. Okay, so if you sign up and register, which you can now with the Project Yano site, you'll get a login and you can access this course. But I'll walk you through, but then I'll, I'll spend um, kind of some time showing you a particular expedition associated with the video Josh showed you, which is exercising in space. But basically the course begins with just an introduction to the course itself, how to navigate the course, uh, information on the various partners involved with the course, be that Explore at Large, um, the the, um, the Aldrin Foundation, uh, the James and Jason, who you met earlier, uh, or you saw earlier, who designed the, the, the kind of what we call the science behind the science. Okay, so this familiarizes you. But then when I mentioned before, um, often sort of curriculum, one of, one of the things that can get in the way of ease of implementation of curriculum is inconsistency, right? A, a unit might consist of multiple lessons, but each one of them is different. Uh, so, you, so teachers have to kind of, of figure out sort of day by day what to do. Well, um, expeditions and missions are all consistent, okay? Every expedition consists of a pre-mission, which is largely the Explore at Large video associated with, in this case, rockets. And then each mission is similar in that mission one is always a data mission, okay? And it's always a data mission where students are using a spreadsheet to analyze data. Now the data they're analyzing is very different. The way they're analyzing it is different. In um, the rockets mission, they're learning about ratios because they have to determine the right ratio for uh, fuel to oxidizer in a rocket engine. Uh, whereas in 
the exercising space, they're learning conversion rate, conversion factors, because they have to automatically use formulas to automatically convert uh, weight on Earth to weight on the moon. Okay, so, so this is an area where, again, an important part of, of Janos is we're not talking, you know, this is really STEM or STEAM. This is, this is where they're doing science, okay, but they're also doing data analysis, which involves technology and mathematics. Mission two is where you get into design. Okay, this is where students are actually going through the first steps of a design process to design the, two, the two-part fuel system of a rocket engine, a, uh, a system for monitoring the ins inside of a spacesuit, uh, a, 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 a space gym, a gym that could be built on the moon. Okay, so this is where they're performing research, they're making decisions, they're doing brainstorming, and they're choosing designs. And these are the designs that uh, can go up into space on a postcard through, through the Club to the Future partnership. Uh, the third mission is where kind of things separate a little bit. This is usually where there's some hands-on activity, but that hands-on activity can vary considerably. In the rockets mission, they're testing rocket fuel uh, to see which gives you the most thrust. In recycling, they're actually recycling wastewater through multiple processes and determining um, if parts of this process can be used in, in space or on the moon. In spacesuits, as I mentioned, they're stitching a space glove um, and testing the repairs. And here in exercising in space, they are actually building a piece of exercise equipment and testing it. So just to walk you through you know, the introduction to the mission, and again, this course for teachers is, we, we tried to think ahead to think of everything you might be considering when you're implementing a mission, right? You first understanding what the expedition's all about through an introduction, um, providing a guidelines of the three missions in the expedition. Okay, uh, in the US at least teachers are, are, have to be aware of how these tie into standards. And so these are how they tie into next generation science standards, but also mathematics and technology standards. Okay, once you get through that, you get to the pre-mission. And again, this is primarily uh, uh, Explore at Large, where we have the particular Explore at Large video that you just watched, exercising in space. But then we also provide how this expedition fits into the scenario. Remember the scenario is that the students are part of a team or set of teams that are helping build a mining facility, an ice mining facility on the moon. Okay, so this shows how this particular expedition fits into that scenario because of course people will be living on the moon for long periods of time. They have to make sure they address issues of cardiovascular bone density and muscle mass through an exercise program. Okay, so that gets you into the first mission. And again, every screen on this mission provides guidance to teachers how to implement the elements of the mission. Okay, so in this one, the mission is a data literacy mission, just like all mission ones. Okay, but this one is using a spreadsheet app to convert the weight of objects on Earth to the same weight of the objects on the moon. Okay, here I should introduce you to uh, what we call a learning plan. Okay, this is probably the equivalent of a, of a unit plan, but it has lesson plans embedded in it, right? So in this case, this provides everything you need for a teacher to implement this mission. If you're familiar with understanding by design, like I, I do work in instructional design and translating the work Jason and James did into an instructional, into an understanding by design document. But this works backwards from goals to evaluation of those goals to learning activities, okay, to the actual activities in the expedition. And so in this expedition, students will be working with spreadsheet software and students have their own illustrated documents to work with, which are called mission journals. And this is where they provide, they're provided all the instructions they need. And I'll show you one associated with uh, mission three, which has uh, more details on it. Okay, but this is where they put in there the results of their experiments, et cetera. So again, each, each one of these provides guidance as to 
what to do in this particular mission. We try to think ahead to everything a teacher might need to think of so that there won't be a lot of guesswork. And again, you know, once you've taught a mission one in any expedition, you'll understand the basics of how to do it for every expedition. Mission two, as I mentioned, is a design mission where students are going through the first steps or what are called the design, the design process. Okay, or the design loop. This is maybe familiar or versions of this are familiar to STEM teachers, where in this case, students are uh, coming up with a design statement, performing research, brainstorming ideas, drawing the best ideas, and then that gets incorporated into their mission journal as a final report. Okay. And mission three is where they execute on the last five steps of the design process, which involves building. Okay. In this case, they are building a piece of exercise equipment, okay? This is a uh, piece of exercise equipment that they can use to perform various cardiovascular exercises. If you can take a look at it, it's a, this is a piece of blue jean material, pant leg, connected with surgical tubing. So again, this is something that is simple to implement. It's new in classrooms, probably, uh, students may not have been, been um, performing exercise routines in the classroom, uh, but it's simple to implement. You don't need a lot of complex materials. And we work this into the scenario, right? Because this is a prototype. Students are learning about prototyping. Obviously, the piece, the version of this that might go to the moon is not going to be made of blue jeans and surgical tubing. It'll be made of more sophisticated material, but that's part of the engineering process. You build your prototypes out of inexpensive materials, and if they pass the various tests, they go further, and then you could, could look at more advanced materials. Um, speaking of testing, that the, these materials are actually being um, tested by, let me find the uh, mission journal, um, by the students themselves, right? They are engaging in a series of exercises, and we could show you those illustrated in this document. Uh, and everything's illustrated, all the instructions for how to build their uh, exercise equipment are illustrated, as are all the instructions for performing the exercises, right? This happens to be uh, Jason's daughter is using the RBED, the exercise device, to demonstrate to students how to perform these exercises, okay? And then they're collecting data. They're collecting data on their heart rate for cardiovascular exercise, but they're also collecting data on their own um, kind of, of burn rate, pain level, when they're working on some muscle exercise or exercise related to bone density, okay? So here, again, this is where a lot of science and engineering is being built in together, okay? This is a mix of quantitative, data like heart rates or pulse rate and qualitative data like personal sensation of burn rate. Uh, this is also a place where students are doing something they may not have done before. They're doing experiments, but them, themselves as a sort of experimental subject. Uh, the other piece I wanted to kind of, of highlight is that this mission is really suitable for team teaching, possibly in conjunction with a member of a physical ed or health department within the school. And the final thing I want to note is that everything in these activities, each mission, even the additional activities, which include some of the additional Explore at Large videos that uh, we had mentioned that, um, you know, what do you do to keep healthy in space? You exercise, but you also have to eat and drink in space. Here's another Explore at Large video where Josh talks to scientists, astronauts, engineers about eating and drinking in space. There's also a section on careers in space where he's talking to some of the experts that he talks to in the other videos and additional resources for teachers. Now, uh, and this one has actually videos of an, a NASA exercise program for young students. Okay, so, so the last piece I want to say is all these elements, I mean, you can teach Project Janos from beginning to end. We think that would be great. You know, there's a lot in there, but we also recognize that um, that may not be how teachers want to fit this in. They may want to do one unit on say recycling as part of an environmental unit where this could be useful for uh, covering earth science as well as space science. 
Um, the exercising unit, as I already mentioned, might be done in conjunction with uh, PE or health specialists. So, so every piece of this is kind of standalone. It obviously does link together, that, uh, but every mission can be introduced into your classroom as its own activity. So again, a, a lot of work was built into, you know, Jason and James's work was built into creating activities that were unique, you know, driven by not just science, but a whole host of STEM issues. And when we tried to incorporate it into the Project Yano's platform, we synthesized it with all the storytelling elements that, um, that Josh talked about, and ultimately trying to create a curriculum that is going to be not just fun, engaging, meaningful, and rigorous for your students, but something that is going to be kind of predictable, understandable, straightforward, easy, so to say it, you know, easy, easier for teachers to implement. So that is the, that's what happens uh, post Explore at Large video, but as you can see, you know, the, the Explore at Large videos are, and the storyline is sort of synthesized throughout. And I guess I will, I could pop that back on the screen if anybody has any questions about the platform during uh, Q&A, but now we'll hand this over to uh, you guys at Mission Control to see if anyone has any questions. Josh, thank you so much. That, that was, sounds fantastic. I love that. Thank you so much, Josh. Great to hear all your adventures as well. I'm, I'm green with envy. <laughs> Susie, was that you that saved me from just talking about everything, or was that someone else who piped in? <laughs> thank you. I appreciate <laughs> that. I was just like enjoying like listening to you, the radio version, and, and then she was like, I'm, "I'm mortified. I will <laughs> take me days to get over that. I'm sorry, I've but thank done you." That before I have done that before, no, no problem. And also. I've, I've also gone through about five slides before someone told me. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. anyway, thank no you. You know, this sounds absolutely fantastic. And I know we've got loads and loads of schools who are online. Actually, they've been sending kind of questions in. And, and the, the one I guess that I want to emphasize is how can they get involved? How can they access this platform? Maybe you could put a link in the chat or something in the chat um, just to let people how, know how to get involved. Because I know there's lots of enthusiasm for this kind of thing. It's so well thought out. You know, you've designed so many activities. You've got supplementary videos, all the things that teachers need to, to put this into the curriculum. So I think everyone's enthusiastic. So if you wouldn't mind putting um, you know, a link into the chat, uh, and we can also kind of promote it as well so that everyone's aware of. Yeah, and, and also on social media. Do you have a mm. web, do you have a sort of Twitter or where are you mainly on yes. social media? Yes, yes. I mean, everything is launching literally today. So it's a oh, little okay. bit of a, okay, a, a little bit of a, a chaotic here, but Project Janos, uh, I-A-N-O-S, projectjanos.org is okay. the hub right now. There's a link that takes you to the Pepper platform Perfect. so that you can then enroll as a teacher. If you're a student, then there's a link that takes you to the YouTube channel so at this point because if you type in project janos on google it should take you to one of our locations <laughs> great, but, great. Yeah. That, that's exactly what everyone wanted to know that's that's really great and here's here's the project Janos site yeah that's our website it's still in development i have a bunch of homework tonight because we're a little bit behind schedule on some things but <laughs> but it gives you the gist of it and, and like i said you enroll you click there as jonathan's hovering and you enroll it'll ask you what school you're in it'll ask you what how many students you have again this mm -hmm. is a teacher designed course if yeah. all you want to do is watch the videos, which is just a piece of that ecosystem we discussed, you can go to YouTube and the Project Yano's channel, and there's a link lower on the page to take you there. And yes, we do have social media uh, placeholders, but we haven't used them as much yet. Okay. Yeah, well. we look forward to yeah, we look forward to the to the launch and finding out more. And uh, I'm, I'm sure lots of people will be excited about this, especially because space is uh, in our national curriculum, of course, but also it looks like what you're doing just covers so many different aspects um, of, of what's in our curriculum in the UK. And, and you know, that's, that's, that's going to be a fantastic resource. So. Can, can, I re can I read out my, the most ridiculous question? Well, it's actually, yeah. <laughs> it's, actually it's from uh, Malika. This is, this is like seriously nerdy. Yeah, it's great. Right. He says, Dallas, uh, the suit behind you, this is like next level nerdery, is an, is an identical one that was used as... Bosk, the bounty hunter in Star Wars, as well as <laughs> Doctor Who. Part of it was also used, was also the rebel pilot suit from Star Wars. So my backdrop is cool. As worn by Luke Skywalker. Uh, yeah. He says our backdrop is cooler than I, you. I, mean, I don't know. I I have, yeah, I, have I so appreciate that Luke detail. <laughs> yeah. That's like, that is, that's not. Someone's done their research. Yeah. Oh, hey, I, I, just, I, I went to ILC Dover as well. They're nice. They're good. They're good people at ILC Dover. The space yes. suit, space suit. 
Good, Good stuff. stuff. Yes. Hey, listen, well, we're kind of running out of time, but I just want to say a huge thank you to you both for, for you know, fantastic presentation. It's a fantastic project you're involved in. It's actually brilliant. And it looks like you're really busy today. So thank you for yeah, taking the time exactly. to come and join us on your launch day. <laughs> yeah. That's about it. We really appreciate okay. it. Okay. Thank you. And if there's a tear in that spacesuit, uh, Expedition that? 3 will teach you how to repair a spacesuit. There we go. Awesome. <laughs> that's, yeah. that is, that, that, there's going to be loads and loads of teachers here who are going to be using all this stuff, and it's, it's brilliant. So thank you very much. Well, thank very you, much. Dallas. Thank you, Susie. We appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. Nice to meet you both. Take care. Nice to meet you, you both. Take care. Thank you very much.